And uh, I see more colleagues are joining, and I believe it's time that we start, uh, so as uh, um, uh, not to waste much of this pressure time. So good morning and uh, afternoon, evening colleagues, everybody who uh, join us today for this webinar event on strategic engagement with the Human Rights Council. Uh, this is uh, one of the webinars in our series, monthly series of webinars organized by the Global Protection Cluster Human Rights Engagement Task Team. So we have had in the past uh, um, dedicated webinars to uh, special procedures, to, um, to the Universal Periodic Review um, and other thematics. So if you are interested to know more, we are happy to share with you the recordings as well. But today we will really focus on uh, the Human Rights Council and more specifically how it is relevant for humanitarian actors. But before we start, I would like to ask actually Isaiah, uh, my dear colleague, uh, co-chair of the Human Rights Engagement Task Team, if he could uh, just tell us in a nutshell, uh, what is this task team? Because not everybody may be familiar with it. So over to you, Isaiah, please. Thank you very much, Valerie, and good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, so the task team on human rights engagement is a task team of the Global Protection Cluster. Um, we are a, rel a relatively new structure. We were established in May 2020, and at the moment we have about 30 non-governmental organizations and UN agencies that are actively participating in the work of the task team. Uh, it is co-chaired by the UN uh, HCR, so Valerie, uh, who is the chair of the task team, together with myself from the Lutheran World Federation and uh, our colleague Elisa from Soka Gakai International. Um, we have been working with um, NGOs and UN agencies that are dealing with many different issues and many different, different parts of the world, um, but on issues of human rights and then on issues of uh, humanitarian um, action. So this has been sort of the unique um, nexus that our, our task team is, is managing. Um, I wouldn't want to say much more, but it is important to just note that um, one of our key objectives as a task team is to use human rights tools uh, to better protect the rights of people that have been affected by humanitarian crisis and we are quite keen to work with and engage with um, existing human rights instruments and mechanisms both um, internationally regionally and in some cases um, nationally uh, we as a task team meet once every every month and so we would be very happy um, to tell you more information and maybe to receive you in our next uh, meeting, which will happen in April. Uh, back to you, Valerie. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Isaiah. And um, again, if somebody is interested to know more about the task team, we would be very happy to connect with you bilaterally. But for now, we will move to our today's event. So uh, we uh, will start, but before we start so that everybody feels comfortable, I would just like to mention as per usual practice in those webinars, if you can post your comments or examples, questions in the chat box, we will be constantly monitoring it uh, and compiling your questions and come back uh, to them after the brief presentations. And we really encourage you to take this uh, uh, event as an opportunity to brainstorm together, uh, to, to exchange good practices. So the more active you are, the more we can uh, get out of it, of course. Uh, I would ask everybody to remain on mute uh, so that we can maximize uh, uh, the quality of the connection. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, also technical problems, please put it in the chat. Uh, uh, we will be um, constantly monitoring that. Excellent. So with that, uh, I think we are all ready. And uh, today we have two distinguished panelists uh, with us um, from the NGO world, which is fantastic. Uh, uh, first of all, Paula Daher, who is the Senior Global Advocacy Advisor uh, in the Center for Reproductive Rights, who will be our first panelist followed by uh, Enzo, Enzo Tabet-Cruz, who is the Growth and Crisis Policy and Advo Advocacy 
officer in Plan International. So both of them have a wealth of experience on engagement with the Human Rights Council and more specifically how it is relevant for humanitarian actors. So I hope this will give us not only inspiration, examples, but also some ideas how we could maybe have similar uh, initiatives also within our organizations or within the cluster system. So without any further delay, I will give the floor to Paula. Um, Paula, over to you, please. Thanks very much, Valerie. I'm just going to share my screen so that everyone can see the presentation. I'm just OK, I'm hoping that it's working now. Um, thank you, Isaiah. <laughs> So uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, many, many, many thanks to the Human Rights Engagement Task Team and to everyone who is joining us today. Um, for those who don't know the Center for Reproductive Rights, maybe I'll start with a very quick introduction. So the Center is a legal advocacy organization that uses the law to further reproductive rights for all women and girls everywhere. And we have offices in New York, DC, Bogota, Geneva, Nairobi, and colleagues um, throughout Asia. Um, and my role as Senior Global Advocacy Advisor based in the Geneva office is really to work at the level of human rights mechanisms. And my main portfolio really is advocacy at the Human Rights Council and its mechanisms, so the special procedures and the UPR. And so today my presentation will really focus on how to kind of leverage the Human Rights Council um, and to make sure that the concerns and the priorities of women and girls at the local, national and regional level are really elevated and amplified in this global body and how to really use it to make sure that whatever outcome of the Human Rights Council kind of goes back to, um, to women and girls themselves in order to create kind of a circle of accountability where they feed into the work of the council and then the work of the council can help them in their own advocacy. And to do that, I will use the, the, the case study of the resolution 4529 um, on women and girls' full enjoyment of human rights in humanitarian situations. So just to give a brief overview, um, I'll go very quickly on the kind of technicalities. Uh, what is the Human Rights Council? What is it that we do uh, as the center kind of using our example um, and why it's important to be working in coalition? And when I'm talking about coalition, it really is wide coalition. So human rights organizations, women's rights organizations, but also um, humanitarian actors whenever relevant, of course, for their work. Um, the action to date and kind of the genesis of the resolution and how it came about and then looking forward how we can work with this resolution how we can kind of sustain it um, uh, looking ahead so first of all, what, what is it that we do uh, at the Human Rights Council and, and what it is to start with? So the Human Rights Council is kind of the apex uh, body. Um, it's the, 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 the highest kind of UN mechanism that we have that is being tasked to addressing and monitoring human rights situations. Um, the council is made of 47 UN member states and it meets three times a year, um, usually in March, June and September, even though COVID has kind of changed that a at all, and it can also convene for special sessions whenever um, a certain situation in a given country, for instance, requires it, or, uh, or or it has happened less for thematic issues, but it can also be triggered for that. Um, in terms of how we engage as the Center for Reproductive Rights and kind of to give you kind of a very basic uh, uh, example on how we've been engaging uh, at the Human Rights Council. So we engage first and foremost on advocacy on resolutions that are relevant to our work. Um, and that is something that uh, we, we do from our Geneva office, but in close collaboration with our regional offices and with our partners in our focus countries. And we really make sure to, um, and really try and ensure that, first of all, in terms of normative development, the highest human rights standards are reflected in resolutions of the Human Rights Council, but also that the priorities that have been highlighted by our by, by, by our partners and, and regional offices are also being highlighted um, and discussed at the Council. So there's the there's the kind of the focus on the resolutions themselves. Um, 
in terms of amplifying the voices that are coming from the, the national and the regional level. Um, we also engage uh, uh, quite uh, quite a, a bit in terms of uh, highlighting our work and amplifying our work through oral interventions um, that we can also present jointly with other organizations and also through the organization of side events, which are also tools to um, outside of the of the of the work on the resolutions, which is mainly kind of working very closely with states during their negotiations and being kind of providing technical support whenever is needed. Um, oral interventions and side events are also spaces for us to co-organize things with other organizations and with activists that are able to also engage at, at the council uh, in order to also kind of amplify uh, the work that we do uh, at the national and regional level and amplify the voices of the movements that we are part of. Um, so there's this work of amplifying, there's this work around uh, a normative development and one of the like the last pillar um, around which our work is articulated, it really is kind of uh, monitoring and countering the opposition. And we work the Center for Reproductive Rights, obviously it's all in the name, we really focus, we're a human rights organization that focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights and it has been a trend uh, for the past, I would say, six or seven years, of course, increase in the last the last four years, and that we have seen a surge in attacks around uh, women's rights in general, gender equality in general, and specifically on the issues that we work on. So we have seen a huge backlash in terms of access to contraception, we have seen a huge backlash in terms of access to abortion, have seen a huge backlash just in terms of um, of right to bodily autonomy, for instance, and certain um, issues that were not perceived as controversial a couple of years ago are now being up for debate, endless debate, may I say, like, you know, gender discrimination, for instance, um, is becoming a term that is being discussed quite a bit. So there is this and, and all of that, of course, in all settings. So these conversations and these debate and this backlash also happen for women and girls in humanitarian situations, regardless of the fact that, you know, our our work has has shown that women and girls still require these services um, in, in when, in they're in, when they're in these situations. And the fact that they are being discussed and challenged obviously disproportionately impact um, women and girls who are being marginalized, among them women on the move. Um, so this is kind of uh, what we do, an overview of, of our work at the Human Rights Council. And one question that we often uh, encounter is, is why engage at the Human Rights Council? And we tend to want to go beyond the very obvious first response that comes to mind, which is oftentimes, well, if we're not in that space, then we kind of leave the whole space to opposition organizations, anti-choice organizations, to gongos, which are NGOs that are um, that are kind of the mouthpieces of certain governments. And so we need to be in this space. But going beyond that, I think it's also important to highlight that um, despite the severe backlash that women's rights organizations have had to face, uh, we have managed to kind of make significant gains at the Human Rights Council in terms of normative development, but also in terms of shaping the agenda itself. And this has come mainly through our work within coalitions. Obviously, there's very little that we can do just us as a, as a, as a human rights organization if we were not working very closely across borders, so very closely with organizations that don't have a presence in Geneva, and also very closely with our colleagues here who are also engaging physically, when physically still had meaning, I mean, um, uh, 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 in Geneva. So um, engaging at the, at, the, at the council has enabled us to kind of craft and carve out a space um, for a discourse that is being shaped by women human rights defenders, by feminist activists, and by women's rights advocates. And that space has enabled significant gains to be made. And just to highlight just a few, um, a couple of years ago, I think around maybe 10 years ago, maternal morta preventable maternal mortality and morbidity were, was not considered a human rights issue. Now we have a standing agenda uh, resolution 
on preventable maternal mortality and morbidity at the Human Rights Council, which is a biannual resolution and that has looked through the years at um, maternal mortality and morbidity, for instance, in humanitarian settings, that, ha that, that, that has looked at the issue, particular issue of morbidities as human rights concern. And that is really enabling us to really centering the voices of women and girls. Uh, 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 in in these conversations and um, and so this is in terms of looking at my slide how impactful the, the uh, our informal civil society coalitions um, the, this this example on on maternal mortality for instance is the direct result of the advocacy of an informal coalition and we will see through the course of the presentation that the resolution on um, the, 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 the resolution on women's and girls' rights in humanitarian situations was also the result of an in, the work of an informal coalition that got together women's rights organizations, child rights organizations, humanitarian service providers, um, and, uh, and general human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, for instance. Um, we also work very closely with Care International. So it has been kind of a collective effort. Uh, and, and I mean, um, and so we'll also speak about that maybe a little in terms of how we've been working together to, for, to ensure that this resolution was being adopt, adopted at the Council. So in terms of action to date and a bit the genesis of this or of, of this resolution, how it came about, um, we kind of built uh, on the momentum that was happening at the Human Rights Council around the issue of SRHR in humanitarian settings. So as I mentioned, we had a resolution on preventable maternal mortality and morbidity that really focused on this issue in humanitarian settings. We also had another resolution on child early and forced marriage in humanitarian settings. We had a resolution on rights of the child in humanitarian settings, and finally a resolution on the rights of persons with disabilities in humanitarian settings. And um, we really noticed that there was appetite from states to really look at the particular intersections of forms of discrimination that happened in these settings that kind of further marginalized um, uh, certain groups uh, of, uh, of persons, but also kind of added barriers to access to sexual reproductive health information and services, barriers to access to justice, barriers to accountability. At the same time, I should also mention that the center um, is working very closely with CARE on a pilot project in northern Uganda, um, where we're kind of looking at uh, incorporating human rights principles in SRH service delivery. And talking with our partners in CARE and working with them on that project, we really saw that there was kind of um, a, a place um, that, that 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 could be filled actually by intervention from the Human Rights Council in terms of ensuring what rights-based accountability would mean for women and girls, something that would come as a complement to all the already existing accountability mechanisms that a lot of humanitarian service providers already have kind of in-house and have developed, um, and also what international humanitarian law would give us, then what is the role of international human rights law? And what is the role of, of human rights bodies in terms of trying to ensure accountability for women and girls in these settings. So with that rationale in mind, seeing the dynamics that were happening at the council, we really thought that the time was ripe to try and advocate for a resolution focusing on rights-based accountability uh, for women and girls in humanitarian situations at the Human Rights Council. And so we started building kind of an informal coalition of allies, as I mentioned, that spanned a very, we tried to make it as diverse and inclusive as possible, um, and, and really kind of working very closely with states. Um, the core group, um, meaning the group of states that is leading on this resolution is cross-regional. Um, it includes Canada, Uruguay, Sweden, Georgia, and Fiji. And there are also a mix of major donor countries, but also countries that are directly affected either by being uh, uh, post-conflict or, um, or by being uh, uh, concerned by natural disasters, for instance. And so with that group of states, work very closely with them they drafted the first uh, the first draft uh, uh, of the resolution, and then we kind of engaged in in the in the advocacy itself uh, last September. We were uh, in, like the dynamics surrounding this issue were interesting because first of all, you know, it's a kind of a new initiative at the council, and so that always kind of 
tends to stir up conversations. But then the very notion of accountability was also being discussed. Um, as I mentioned, some concepts that are core to international human rights law that you didn't used to be controversial, controversial all of a sudden become subject to conversations, which we found quite interesting. But after kind of um, a long process of negotiations, the resolution was finally adopted by consensus. Um, and it is important because it's the first resolution um, at the at the Human Rights Council that really looks at meaning meaningfully considers women and girls um, full participation in all areas that uh, are, are relevant to them in the context of humanitarian situations. And it's the first resolution that just looks at the full realization of their rights in these specific situations from a human rights based uh, perspective. It looks at the interlinkages between IHL and IHRL, not in depth, because it's a procedural resolution, meaning that kind of it initiates the whole stream of work that needs to happen at the council. So it's just kind of we had one para on the, the, the interlinkages of, on IH, of IHL and IHRL, but we also had one para on meaningful participation, access to services, kind of laying the ground um, for the work that is to come at the council. Um, and it requests the, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to prepare a report um, that should be presented uh, at uh, now I for, I'm, I'm blanking on the on the specifics at uh, the 49th session of the Human Rights Council, and then we will have looking forward the substantive resolution that will kind of unpack all of these concepts. But now, for now, ahead of us, we have a report that is re that is really going to be instrumental in terms of fleshing out what it means, um, what rights-based accountability means for women and girls in humanitarian situations. And so, as I mentioned, in terms of the next steps, um, we'll have that report. I, I cannot stress enough how the perspective from humanitarian service providers will be um, in the in the in the realization and the writing and drafting of that report. OHCHR um, will share a call for submissions that we're happy to share. I'm happy to share with the with the task team when it comes, and. I think that it would be crucial to highlight all of the already existing accountability mechanisms that that uh, um, that exist out there and the lessons learned from these mechanisms and how can it be improved and what is the role of human rights in improving them and how can they be replicated and how can um, all stakeholders meaningfully engage with governments in order to Kind of make mainstream these mechanisms um, in 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 uh, uh, accordance, if I can put it this way, with uh, governments' human rights obligations that continue to apply and to be applicable in humanitarian settings, whichever they might be. So the report will be uh, highly useful. I also want to put it in parallel with a report that the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls will be presenting to the Council this June, which is a report on SRHR in crisis. And I really think that uh, with both these reports, um, normative development, when it comes to that specific issue, will kind of take leaps and bounds. I have good hope. So I would highly again encourage you to send submissions to the OHCHR report. Um, Center's event, we will have uh, uh, an event in June um, for the, for the report on SRHR in crisis. Um, we're happy to collaborate with whoever might be interested. Um, I can also share my contacts for those who don't have it. And in 2022, we will have the substantive resolution that we really look at all the elements that form rights-based accountability and what are the relevant human rights standards that you know go with when we say safe, effective, full and, uh, and, and meaningful participation of women and girls in humanitarian situations? What is it that we mean? Um, how to ensure access to justice? How to look at justice beyond legal responsibility and criminal responsibility of perpetrators of sexual violence, which is where the, con the, the discussion has been centered. So really kind of diving more deeply um, but that's for 2022. Um, and I think I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any comments. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Paula, for this very uh, comprehensive, I would say, an inspiring overview of all the relative initiatives that the Center for Reproductive Rights has been conducting uh, around Human Rights Council and engagement with it. And with that, I would actually pass the floor directly to Enzo uh, to share uh, the experience of Plan International and complement also Paula's presentation. Over to you, Enzo, please. Hi, Valerie. Thank you very much also for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and uh, presenting a bit of plans of work on the on the Human Rights Council and hopefully to bring some insights as well for for all the participants as well, how they can engage in some some of the uh, some of the conditions that also allow for that. So before I go on, I think it's important also to highlight uh, just to explain a bit uh, which perspective we're coming from. So uh, a bit complementary to uh, and a bit differently from from what uh, Paula was mentioning about the, the center. We are uh, an NGO who works more on the operational side, so we have programs uh, in, in in countries, uh, humanitarian programming is on, on 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 all of the on most of the humanitarian crisis across the world, which brings uh, a similar but as well a different lens, and it comes also with different limitations and also with with different enabling factors and how do we engage with, uh, with the Human Rights Council. Uh, just before also moving forward, I would just like to say that uh, my role here in Geneva works mostly on the humanitarian policy side of things. So engaging, uh, making sure that the perspectives of girls and young women are reflected within all of the global policy processes on the humanitarian side and particularly on the forced displacement issues, uh, but as well on, on some of the crisis specific countries we work with and that we and that we have issues to raise on uh, on the global on the global forest. So bringing basically an age, gender, and diversity lens to to the whole humanitarian um, policy, uh, and of course now more recently to the human rights aspect of things, which I'm going to explain in a minute. So before moving forward, I just wanted to give a just really short presentation about Plan International and who we are. So we are a development and humanitarian organization. Uh, that we've mandated to advance children's rights and equality for girls. And we are active in 75 countries, uh, with 42 of them are affected by humanitarian crisis. And our work uh, on humanitarian crisis goes uh, from, um, you know, the classic WASH programmings, but also on child protection, education and, and gender equality, and particularly looking at the participation of young girls affected by conflict uh, in uh, in, in the different policy processes. Okay, so basically this this is uh, the, the, the main question, right? Why to bring humanitarian issues to the Human Rights Council? And then here I'm speaking about the perspective of, of, uh, of the more humanitarian work. So first of all, uh, is, it is an, an instrument for country accountability in protracted crisis. Uh, I think we all know here that the majority of humanitarian crisis right now are long-term uh, which requires different solutions and, and different aspects of access to rights and services in countries, which becomes extremely important that we use the, the, the current mechanisms and the current ways to bring those this accountability to, to practice. Uh, so I bring example basically to, to of IDPs and refugees and also highlight the fact that we don't have any obvious uh, forward to come to for accountability for those populations uh, on a global scale. Um, so yeah, so I would like to highlight that within those instruments for country accountability, uh, there are, for example, the fact-finding missions and the commissions of inquiry, which are, are mandated to verify the situation of human rights in some of the countries, and that's uh, uh, that's one of the things uh, why it's important to to bring about the, the humanitarian aspects to to those mandates and make sure that they are reflected on their on the reports and on and on their their work. I'm going to come back to this later. And the second is it is an effective global platform to bring attention to humanitarian crisis. And that's particularly on what I mentioned before about states responsibility to uphold the rights of refugees in IDPs. And that's on areas that we are all uh, familiar, which is about education, protection, access to health, and particularly also for, for refugees and, and you know, in, in, in the recent development you know, within the that the Global Compact on Refugees wants to achieve as well, and now recently on the high-level pan and IDPs, those access to services become uh, even more important to bring about and to, to make sure that they are addressed. And that's why it, uh, the Human Rights Council, it's 
another good body to bring about the specificities of, of in our case, of gross education, for example, uh, for refugee gross education uh, on the Human Rights Council, but also on child protection and, uh, and others. Then the third uh, is that it complements traditional humanitarian advocacy, which most of you are, are, are used to in your daily work, which is basically about the uh, more focused on the coordination, on the funding aspect of the crisis, on the in, in intrinsicalities of response. Uh, so it, it brings basically a new perspective and complements through rights-based uh, rights based approach that enables you know, new responses and, and new ways to, to, to complement what the traditional humanitarian advocacy that we do uh, works in practice. So uh, now I'm going to walk through some of the avenues we have used, and it's important also to highlight that this work uh, has been recent. So we have been engaging on this in the past three years, more or less, and really stepping up this year on the different uh, initiatives. So the, the first of all, it's engagement with the Human Rights Council resolutions. So what, what would be the goal of engaging, uh, you know, on the humanitarian perspective on that? So basically, as Paula was mentioning, is to contribute to this long-term standard setting and framing of issues. So certain issues, uh, for example, like uh, birth registration and this kind of things in humanitarian settings, where you need to consider a human rights issue before, uh, but also uh, to bring specific perspectives and framings of some of the traditionally human rights issue to bring more humanitarian perspective to those. And that we have the rights of the child in humanitarian settings, we have also the child marriage, which was another resolution which brought about, you know, what 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 are the kind of violations that young 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 girls face uh, on on those humanitarian crises, and the last one, which Paul has uh, has explained in details about the accountability for women and girls in humanitarian settings. So it's really about building this long this framing and long term standard setting uh, for the, the issues uh, happening on in the humanitarian settings. Uh, the second of all, I'm not going to focus too much on those because I'm aware that you also had a different webinar around engagement with special procedures. But nevertheless, it's important to highlight that it is an important space where you can bring emerging humanitarian issues on really specific themes. Uh, and for us, engagement with the special rapporteur and IDPs uh, has been really a wonderful uh, collaboration that that uh, it's really on its core and of the bandit uh, to have this integration about the issues that happens with internally inter displaced people and bring them with a human rights angle and accountability angle. But there's also other special repertoires that are, we have equally used to bring about some of the, the, some of the issues we have been witnessing on some of the humanitarian crisis we work. Uh, sorry about the, the order. Yes, so then the first one uh, and the other one which I would like to highlight and that's probably very interesting for you is that is about the interactive dialogues and unconscious specific situations. Uh, and those are discussions uh, at the Human Rights Council, which are based on, on some of the accountability that I mentioned before, the accountability instruments like the fact-finding missions, commissions, or, uh, or reports of, of independent experts around certain country-specific situations that bring about what are the human rights situations happening in country. So for us, the two, we, we, we had uh, two goals of engaging on those. First of all, to analyze how global discussions were addressing uh, the, the specific conflicts we were working on to gauge a bit the political dimension of some of the humanitarian crisis to better inform our own advocacy in country. Uh, so the second one is, 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 uh, is more an active role, which is to raise issues that we witness on the humanitarian crisis there are, uh, that are affecting our humanitarian programmings, uh, particularly to problems we face in the country offices that couldn't be raised otherwise at national level. Uh, so we had a, a recent example of CAR. I'm not gonna walk through uh, 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 the content of it because it's confidential, but it was, uh, we basically brought, brought about some of the concerns we witnessed in the country and that we couldn't otherwise raise it at the national level. And we brought it here to, with the hopes that it can be elevated at, at, the, at, the, at the global level and bring about some of discussions and, and perhaps influence the discussions in country as well. And then third, uh, since we're talking about country specific situations, there is the, the, the Universal Periodic Review, which is the UPR, which I'm not gonna go into the detail here, but is also an, a peer-to-peer -peer review instrument from the Human Rights Council that reviews uh, the situations in certain countries, but reviewed by other countries within the Human Rights Council. So that's also 
so another point we have been engaging to bring about some of the country specific situations. And then finally, uh, we also have been engaging on statements for the special representative of the Secretary General of Children and Conflict. And that's it's uh, it, it's a way to bring visibility to specifically to the violations of the rights of girls in conflict. So the so reintegration of children in conflict and other issues, uh, and basically to react uh, and raise issues that we find that on her report are not being addressed or praise some of the issues that she has addressed that that uh, relates to our priorities in the country. So finally, uh, which kind of conditions we, we figure out that really facilitated our humanitarian engagement with the Human Rights Council. So first of all, uh, our mandate is anchored in a really strong rights based uh, and humanitarian approach. So we have the what we call you know, the nexus approach, uh, which is both humanitarian development, but also adding the layer of human rights within it. Uh, then second, it's working coalitions with peer organizations like the Center for Reproductive Rights, which allows us for complementarity, for bringing really a diversity of angles and mitigate a bit of the issues in relation, uh, the sensitivities that we have on some of the humanitarian crisis of bringing some of those issues to Global Four that can affect our operations. Then third, uh, we had really work in close connection with the country office to specific discussions of concern. So this is to say that we are doing a liaison role, uh, which is really being uh, being based on the work that we do in country office and the specific discussion that happens there. Then the fourth is being able really to provide this this piece of, of advice so to, to really frame, help to frame engage uh, develop specific advocacy materials with the language that is mostly effective to to the engagement of the human rights council policy briefs and then the the the, the last one which is also linked to this last one uh, is is to help colleagues really to utilize this networks of ngos and permanent missions that we have in geneva for maximizing the impact of our, of our advocacy and again to mitigate some of the risks that is inherent in bringing really sensitive information uh, that are commonly happening on humanitarian crisis uh, across the globe that we work. So I think that from my side, that's it. So I'm happy to take any of your questions and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Enzo. And as you were speaking, actually, there are some ideas that came to my mind how we can uh, uh, get inspiration from, from your examples and better engage with the Human Rights Council. So I hope uh, the same effect uh, was also for colleagues. And uh, I would encourage um, all of you who are listening today to us to really take this opportunity and pose the questions. At the meantime, I will uh, go back to Paola and Enzo with the questions we received through the registration forms for this event. And uh, we uh, start um, the exchange panel. So I will uh, just um, put the questions out there and I let you decide, uh, Paula and uh, Enzo, how, how you divide the questions, if OK, if OK for you. So the first one is, um, how, what is the impact of engagement with the Human Rights Council? Can you already uh, share some examples uh, if you have seen how uh, the engagement with Human Rights Council has yielded some uh, concrete impact on, on your organization's work, on your policy, on your projects? So this was one question. The second one, how can we know what are the themes uh, coming up uh, um, through the Human Rights Council resolution? So how can we know what are the relevant humanitarian topics that will be put forward uh, at the Human Rights Council agenda and how we can uh, um, then better plan for our engagement? And the third question that we have is, um, how do you involve field colleagues in uh, in those initiatives? Do you consult with them? Do you get their inputs? Or uh, what is the connection between field and global? And then uh, maybe I will stop here at this moment and uh, give the floor back to Paula and Enzo to share some insight on those. Thank you. Over to you. I can start, Enzo, if you want. Okay. Uh, I'll take the 
easiest to the last two questions because the impact question I think is is one that we still ask ourselves every day. So how to know about the themes coming up at the council? So on the extranet uh, you can find on I can I can share all of that after maybe it can be circulated on the list serve but on the extranet of the Human Rights Council you have um, the the calendar of thematic resolutions and so it's organized like it's it's resolutions that come that are annual biannual triannual um, and uh, according to which sessions they're usually discussed at. Uh, of course, that doesn't take into account the changes that can happen. So, for instance, the preventable maternal mortality and morbidity resolution was meant to be discussed last September. It will be discussed this June. But, you know, this, you know, where the center is part of the of the of the task team. And so you can also put out that question uh, whenever whenever is needed. But the, the calendar is kind of a good resource to go to um, and then you do and the program of work that is published ahead of each session you see what are the topics that will be discussed what are the the, the special procedures that will be presenting at this session so you, you kind of get kind of the agenda for that particular uh, for that particular session um, how do we involve uh, field colleagues? So, as I mentioned, we work very closely with our regional uh, offices and with our partners. I think that um, that manifests more clearly when we engage on country situations. So, the center princip like particularly engages on thematic resolutions. That is kind of our bread and butter. But we have been uh, lately engaging a bit more on certain country resolutions, like South Sudan, for instance. At some point, we also engaged on the resolution on Myanmar, um, and that came as a as a request uh, from from our colleagues um, in the regions. Um, and so, how we involve them is basically a kind of you know we we have joint work plans with them. So at the beginning of each of our fiscal year when we're doing the planning we kind of you know discuss what is it that what issues they want to elevate what country situations they want to elevate and we work together on making sure that ha that happens so i share um or what you know my what i know with regards to the work of the council what is coming up why is engaging on certain um on a certain uh, resolution would be impactful for instance to give a very um, very concrete example, uh, the resolution on South Sudan is being discussed currently at this session of the Human Rights Council, and we got together with other CSOs to ask for a renewal of the Commission on Human Rights in South Sudan. Um, why? Because it's one of, it's, I think, the only accountability mechanism that is council mandated that has documentation of sexual and gender based violence in, built in their mandates. Um, so that was particularly important to us. And so I've worked with my colleagues um, in our Nairobi office who worked with their uh, with their partners in South Sudan. And so that's kind of you know, why it's I, I kind of try and, and 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 explain why it would be important for us to be um, to be in these conversations. And they also um, it's an exchange, basically. Um, in terms of the impact of our engagement, if we have seen a concrete impact, um, we have actually. I think that me I mean measuring impact in terms of human rights is always is always very difficult. Um, it it's kind of something that takes a long time to see how much and how impactful it has been. It can be as you know, um, difficult to measure as Human Rights Council resolution being used at the national level. So I remember, for instance, um, being myself from Lebanon when I was working there and being a feminist activist in that particular context, we used to utilize the outcomes of the Human Rights Council and its mechanisms for our internal advocacy at the national level. And we did that in addition to doing a million other things, but that was kind of one of our tools in our advocacy toolbox to try and change laws, to try and change policies and practice. So that can be, you know, something that we have seen happen over and over again. Um, whenever there is you know, uh, a, a movement at the national level that is pushing for legislative changes, whatever comes from the UN is use, is useful. I think that Enzo has mentioned the special procedures. Whenever a special rapporteurs 
publishes a, a public statement on a specific issue, it kind of adds to um, the, the, the different avenues for advocacy that you already have as a woman in a national or, lo or local uh, context. In terms of the impact it has had in our organization, I think that the whole thinking, for instance, at the center, um, uh, not the whole, um, but because we are also part of the, the interagency working group on reproductive health and crisis, for instance, but it's when OHCHR really started talking about cre the creation of a circle of accountability in the context of maternal mortality in humanitarian situations that it really kind of shifted our, our thinking. So that was a direct uh, impact that came from the resolution, that mandated OHCHR with the report, and that report, that 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 concept was uh, was was uh, laid out, and it got us to think differently around. All right, so accountability with regards to women and girls in humanitarian situations has focused so far, overwhelmingly, on sexual and gender-based violence and on accountability as criminal responsibility, international criminal law putting the spotlight on perpetrators rather than putting the spotlight on women and girls themselves who beyond SGBV also suffer gross violations of human rights law in, uh, in, in these settings. And how do we um, how do we manifest that reality and what does it mean in terms of shifting our understanding of accountability? And so I think that that, that is for me one of the most concrete examples that I can give. Um, and how it kind of inspired the rest of our work. Thank you so much, Paula. Uh, very comprehensive uh, answer. Over to you, Enzo, please. Yes, yes. Um, I will complement some of the points, but I think I'll be mostly focusing on the first question on the impact on, on, on the other one on the field and global. Uh, I think that those are essential questions on the work uh, we do, and especially sitting in Geneva, this is a question we have been seldom asked. And it's a seldom difficult uh, question to re respond because there is this issue about measuring impact and particularly on advocacy that sometimes is really five years time frame at least to have to for you to witness impact and 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 really showcase and, and prove um i think that this long term uh, this long-term impact can be easily defined by the fact that for example issues like child marriage wasn't even considered a human rights violation right, you know six years ago uh, and now they are and there even consensus about humanitarian crisis and this kind of things so there is a really clear and added value of, of this global spot, this kind of global discussions and framing and really bringing about the, the, the evolving situations. Um, I think that another impact uh, that I can see, you know, from, from at least plans engagement, and uh, it's about the spotlight. It's really about bringing, uh, bringing some of the information that otherwise wouldn't be wouldn't be able to be public in some of the countries, for example, and, 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 and amplify impact of things that are happening already on the on the control level and that has been raised for example on a submission we have we are working now on accountability for idps for the high level panel uh, within the interviews we have done that has been consistently raised as one of the added value of having a global space to discuss like issues of of, of uh, on the rights of idps for example and is essential for accountability another impact that we have witnessed is is uh I think is also information. So I think a lot of the countries, they have in-country capacity to do advocacy and they are all, always welcome to receive information and analysis on how the country they are working with, they, they have been addressing certain issues at the global level and that they can use and, and really pressure them at the country level. So it's, it's this kind of information, which leads to the second point also um, is that it gives a basis for advocacy at country level. It's it, we, we have witnessed several times that some of our countries, like Colombia, for example, brings about some of the discussions and they incorporate that to their messages into their narrative, and particularly that with UPR, for example, that they incorporate that because it is like an accountability mechanism and they can use that and also use the country visit, for example, from some of the fact-finding missions to really raise some of the intrinsic uh, dynamics of, the, of, of some of the conflicts. And then finally, um, I think that um, one of the biggest impacts, and that's a subjective one, is that quite a lot of our country colleagues have said that they feel that the issues have been heard. Because, uh, for example, in, in, in the example of the Central African Republic, I told you, uh, it's, it's a kind of a forgotten crisis. And like, globally speaking, even the humanitarian side, the funding has been you know, decreasing, the, the spotlights 
on the humanitarian side has been really complicated to bring about. And uh, and, and and being able for, for letting some of the colleagues to bring about some of those issues to a higher fora that it, otherwise they couldn't raise at their national level really help them to feel that you know their issues have been addressed and they have kind of some avenues to 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 maneuver. And of course, it all depends on the capacity of the country as well to engage and, and the capacity of the country to follow up and to bring that uh, to the attention that that's speaking about the country specific uh, issues. Uh, so on the field and global, I think I've spoken a bit about that. I think that one of the factors uh, of this relationship is is to amplify uh, really complicated information uh, on the country level, really complicated issues that you can amplify using the global level, uh, and that the Human Rights Council is really effective to bring, specifically on a confidential way, if you don't want to be mentioned or in a coalition, for example. Uh, yeah, amplify local advocacy, and uh, and I think that from global to local, if, my, if I might say, uh, we have also witnessed that uh, this also brings back to the country kind of a stronger stance and a stronger uh, uh, fundament to their own advocacy. And that's uh, and that's not only of the Human Rights Council, uh, but also other global processes like the Global Compact on Refugees and others. You know, we witnessed that having this global perspective of, of, of what's the narrative and what's the 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 the, the line that 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 the discussions have been drawing the global level helps them to really incorporate that and be more impactful on 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 the on the local level so i think that's that's some of the yeah, the, the kind of relationships yeah. Thank you so much for those very, very concrete examples uh, to both of you. Uh, again, a lot of ideas coming in. I'm just wondering uh, if our colleagues from OHCHR who are online would like to add uh, just very briefly some elements on, on um, the upcoming 2022 substantive resolutions uh, and the involvement. I give you the space if you would like, otherwise you can put it in the chat box as well. And uh, uh, I don't see you coming in, so I will proceed with the second round of comments, complementing from the registration form and also from Ivona. Thank you so much for uh, for putting it in the in the chat box. So. The first question, and again, I let you divide between you and respond, uh, as you have seen in the chat. Um, have, then, have there been uh, discussions how the states actually define the humanitarian situation around the negotiation? So this is the, the first aspect. And um, the second question, uh, humanitarian situations imply sometimes that the state powers may be disputed at national level with the involvement of non-state actors. So do you think that there is room for the resolution to recognize the accountability of non-state armed groups? So very good question. And I would add to this a third question um, that came, do you have any lessons learned uh, from your engagement with the Human Rights Council, noting that it is quite recent, uh, as you explained, uh, last few years, but uh, is there already some kind of uh, um, lessons learned that you have started to see it that would also serve to other colleagues on the call uh, further? So over to you. Thank you very much for these questions. So the first one around have states defined uh, what humanitarian situations mean? Yes, I'm just going to copy paste that para in the chat box so you have it. Um, that comes straight from the resolution. So the first time that it was discussed, it was when we were discussing the resolution on child early and forced marriage in humanitarian situations. And at the time, they had defined uh, uh, in its re resolution 35-16, they had defined humanitarian settings as humanitarian emergency, forced displacement, forced displacement armed conflicts, natural disasters, and then the uh, sudden onset natural disasters and slow onset events was added in the resolution on accountability and I think that was one of the the, the very necessary addition and this is why it was crucial to have a country like Fiji on the core group because they were the ones who really elevated this issue. So for the purpose of this resolution and, and the substan subsequent substantive resolutions that will that will come out, um, this is the definition of, uh, of humanitarian situations. And in terms of uh, the responsibility and accountability for violations perpetrated by non-armed groups, 
Absolutely. And this is why it was also important to right off the bat really highlight the relationship between humanitarian law, humanitarian law and human rights law, um, because these questions are, the, are going to come in. Um, the center is preparing uh, a technical paper on uh, the interlinkages between uh, international humanitarian law, human rights law, um, and refugee law, and it, it should be published in the next month or so. And I will share it. Uh, I will share the publication once it's out. Where we have looked uh, at also, we also have looked at non-state non uh, actors, um, and um, as as we know, it's kind of an ongoing debate uh, in the uh, in the field. Um, we re really kind of led consultations to make sure that uh, we get it right because it's not nothing is kind of set in stone but um, I think that it will be absolutely necessary uh, that accountability for non-state actors uh, and and armed group but also you know I'm also thinking about donors for instance I'm also thinking about like a wide range of non-state actors who can perpetrate who can perpetrate um, uh, uh, violations but also have a role to play in terms of accountability um, outside of perpetrating violations I mean as well so I think that it would also be important to look at all the different stakeholders and um, the last uh, question around lessons learned I mean <laughs> One, I think one that directly comes to mind for me is uh, work at the Human Rights Council. Timing is everything. Um, you know, we kind of really uh, uh, banked on the, the momentum that was existing around humanitarian situations at the Council. It didn't come from from any from nowhere. We kind of took an incremental approach. But I have to say that, you know, every the, 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 the membership changes. And so, you know, you can also find yourself with a council that might not be uh, uh, very favorable to bringing new initiatives, to bringing new initiatives on women. So I think that um, the first thing that I would say really is like timing and preparation um, uh, are, are everything. Um, another lesson that I've learned is, you know, like expect the unexpected. We We really struggled with seeing how a, the the notion of accountability, which is kind of one of the major human rights principle undermining uh, underpinning the whole human rights architecture, became subject to debate when we were talking about this resolution, and we understood kind of the um, the resistance from some states who thought that there would be a crude scrutiny. Uh, over host countries, for example. So, you know, that was the argument that host countries are doing what they can. And now with this initiative, you want to add on scrutiny over what it is that we do. And it's just us. And what about other states? And so it created, kind of, even though these states themselves might sponsor or, or lead on other resolutions that literally have accountability in the title. And so that was, you know, uh, we also needed to be prepared for these conversations. Um, even though they were some somewhat uh, unexpected. So I guess that would be uh, preparation, timing. And when we say preparation, it really is being prepared even for things that you didn't even factor in. Thank you, Paula. Uh, very, very well noted. Uh, over to you, Enzo. Yes, I, I'm not going to, to, to elaborate uh, much more what uh, Paula has mentioned, as she's kind of the she's really the ex expert on this uh, on this uh, resolution. I think that um... oh, sorry, I think you're I lost back. you. Yeah, you're back. back. Yes. Yeah. I'm just saying that I'm not going to elaborate too much on the questions because Paula is really the expert on on this specific resolution. I would just like to also call attention to one of the things which I witnessed on the in, on the informal negotiation of this resolution is the backlash and and how how this was framed really. Um, I think there were two sides. One one that some of the states were really putting forward the view that um, having refugees, uh, particularly in IDPs, were kind of you know they were already being really uh, doing uh, was was like kind of a really generous act. Which yeah, I mean. It is, but it also is also international obligation, and they also have an international obligation of of respecting the human rights of this population. So it's kind of this really perspective uh, that that's um, 
not of, of, of those subjects as, as the rights holders, but really like kind of a, a population that happens to be there and that they're doing an effort. So it's really this need to strike the balance also between the, the, the accountability and the, the kind of support for accountability. Um, yeah, so this, this kind of dichotomy as well, uh, but also, you know, the kind of regular backlashes on what happens on women's rights as well, you know, about perspectives around all the independence of women and, and all the backlash against sexual reproductive health and rights empowerment. So taking this aside, of course, which is really a classic reaction from those kind of states. Um, on the lessons learned, I will also complement what, uh, what, what Paulo was saying, that I think that one of the lessons learned for, in our case is that really having a staff or, or a colleague which, which was able to to really advise and have access to networks and opportunities and helped also colleagues to navigate on, on the different channels, opportunities, and sometimes also bureaucracy about engaging on some of the of the human rights uh, council processes really helped. Uh, and, and this also leads to another point, which is kind of, it requires thinking a bit outside of the box because my role is also eminently humanitarian, but it has this humanitarian, which is human rights components in built in it because it is an understanding that you can't have a really a full picture of, of, of humanitarian situations if you also don't integrate a rights-based approach. And that also led to, to, to really finding some solutions that are outside and underexplored by really traditional uh, humanitarian uh, NGOs or, or, or action. Um, also talking about uh, perspective from also working on other, other really humanitarian uh, NGOs. Uh, and then I think that the third, the, 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 the last one, it's really about partnership of the country offices. I think that this is on the core of it. It's not to, it's really to explain as, as any, any good partnership, you really explain, you really build together with the country, the priorities, build within the country, the level of engagement, the kind of, of, uh, of time, of time uh, not, not only on the time that you spend on those kind of processes, but also on the added value, because it's not clear. And given the, the 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 this power dynamic that seldom exists between global and national, sometimes country offices feel compelled to engage because you know it's the global level that is asking. So reshaping this kind of relationship and making sure that this is equal that that the country offices are are, are from are, are present from the planning to the to the follow up. It was really really key for our, for our, for our to bring this kind of successful engagement on the Human Rights Council. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Enzo. And actually, you somehow summarized also uh, the objectives and goal of the Human Rights Engagement Task Team, really, uh, that uh, the fact that we cannot have the full picture in the humanitarian settings if we don't have the human rights angle and that we need to have it driven from the country, from the field going up to global. This is really at the core of what we are trying to, uh, to achieve. Very good. Uh, thank you so much, Paola and Enzo. I think we have no further comments uh, from participants coming in. So I believe uh, we are coming to the close of this event. Uh, I know that uh, some colleagues uh, or um, you have been reaching through different means, WhatsApp, etc. would be interested to engage further in the 2022 substantive resolutions uh, resolution. So uh, Paula, uh, maybe if you can also uh, share the contact uh, with colleagues who may not have it also Enzo, if uh, colleagues, uh, if it's OK for you, would like to reach out bilaterally. But otherwise, we invite you uh, to also so if you are interested and curious about the work of the human rights engagement asking to reach out to Isaiah and uh, uh, and myself and we would be happy to to discuss with you uh, how uh, to take this forward and eventually how to support you in your country operation as needed uh, through this process. So again, um, I would like to thank uh, first of all uh, our panelists, Paola and Enzo, for sharing your practices, your experience, uh, a lot of inspiring examples for us that we will need to digest, process and maybe get um, uh, inspired uh, also for us going forward. And also colleagues to all of you joining us from all regions and uh, mainly from the field, as we could see, which is fantastic and uh, get stay tuned for our next webinar in April, uh, which you will receive an invitation for very soon. So thank you everybody and have a great rest of the day.
Bye. Thank you.